Welcome back to press coverage. A big shout out to uh, Billy Muzio and Matty Kiwum, who handled this uh, chair last week during crossover week. That was a really cool episode. Um, but I'm happy to be back. Uh, my guest today is Davis Maddock. Um, he's a guy that, uh, you know, I'm sure if you're you're following him at this point on Twitter, he's everywhere. You find him on a lot of podcasts. His content is all over the place. Uh, he's well known for his takes. And, uh, you know, last year he had uh, pretty some decent hits, including Ramondre Stevenson. So we're going to touch on that. Uh, but this podcast is all about sharp takes, actionable information, and ident identifying the edges we need to win. I think it's finding, you know, I'm finding a more difficult time you know, getting those edges as we're kind of in the information age where we're getting kind of like dumped on with, you know, constant camp information, you know, constant uh, analytics and stats, but we're going to attempt to, you know, find some information today that can help you crush your leagues. But Davis, welcome to press coverage. You're like the fifth guest in the history of this podcast. So uh, that that's cool. And uh, where can everybody find you now? And, and what are you dropping these days? Yeah, everyone can find me on Twitter, at Davis Maddock. You can listen to the Take Cast. You can listen to the Sports Grid Fantasy Football Show. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can watch Sports Grid TV. If you got a smart TV, you get it for free. Turn it on. Start scrolling through your stuff. You've got it. Uh, you've probably seen Sports Grid on at, uh, at the gym, at the airport bar. I get that. I get that. I'll, I'll get people texting me being like, dude, you're, you're on the TV at the airport right now. Uh, my show, Fantasy Sports Today, is on at uh, 8 o'clock Central Time on Saturday mornings and then replays throughout the week. Yeah, and you've been dropping a lot of like really, really quality uh, podcasts. Uh, a big hat tip. I listened to the uh, one, the recent one with John Daigle, I thought was excellent. Uh, you also dropped the recent one with, I, I believe it was Pat Corain and, and and Sam Sherman. That was also very good. When, when are the podcast uh, versions dropping? Uh, when are you dropping your pods, Davis? So we do ADP chasing on Mondays. That's on uh, YouTube and then cross posted to Sports Grid Fantasy Football Podcast. Take Cast comes out 90% of the time on a Wednesday, or hope normally Wednesday morning, sometimes Wednesday afternoon. And then uh, the other episodes of the Sports Grid Fantasy Football Podcast, when we're not in the regular season, when we're in the regular season, it'll be out every day. But uh, in the off season, it's really just twice a week whenever sort of uh, I get around to it. That's uh, that's like the last thing on my action item list every week. And sometimes it doesn't always get checked off. And you're doing the uh, the waiver wire show again this year. Yep, we got uh, we'll do we'll have waiver wire. We'll have the Gilcast back. Uh, that's probably sometimes this year it's going to be recorded on Monday mornings, but normally Sunday nights, uh, we'll do DFS show. We'll do picks against the spread with rich rebar, all the, all the good stuff that's been there in years past. Yeah. And I'll give you a, a hat tip because I do, uh, a waiver wire article and I like try to consider my waivers to be deep and impactful for high stakes players. And I think Davis also does that, you know, it's not going to be your kind of cookie cutter, uh, you know, Go, go get this guy that everybody rosters. It's going to be some very deep names that I think can help you in any, in any single format. Uh, the news we got to kind of react to is we just got the news in that we were all kind of expecting was today uh, Roger Goodell met with Alvin Kamara and it looks like there's going to be a suspension. Uh, we don't know how many games. What would be your guess to how many? I think... Four seems right to me, given that there was no felony. Um, that's just sort of, to me, that feels like the mean length of an NFL suspension when there is no actual legal issue, when there's no jail time. Um, you know, basically, I think, I, I believe if I'm right, now I'm not a legal expert, but I, I think he just pled to a misdemeanor. And, you know, it's like it happened a long time ago. I actually think it, that helps Kamara out in this. It's just not as much in the forefront um, there was that report that came out yesterday that he's meeting with the commissioner today or tomorrow. So we'll probably get news on the length of that pretty soon. But my, my guess, I've just been drafting like Kamara is going to miss the first four games of the season, which I still kind of like him. Other, other people in our, our little corner of the world don't really like him, but to me, you know, you give me, you give me 10 weeks of Alvin Kamara, basically 12 weeks of Alvin Kamara. I still think he's probably like, he was pretty bad last year. But, I mean, he's still got some gas, and I think Carr is going to be better than Dalton. And they have 11 Dome games, which I which I really like. Yeah, it's interesting. He's RB29 on underdog now, so it's kind of like this is already baked in. You could maybe see him drop a spot or two, but I don't think it's going to be that 
uh, that hard of a drop. I think what's going to be more interesting is does Kendra Miller continue to rise? Jamal Williams uh, maybe see a bump up because both of those guys are in low end uh, RB four land. Williams has gone down since we thought when since we had the the legal outcome. Are you in on drafting one of these kind of contingent upside guys in, in Williams or Miller? No, I think they're both. The issue is, is I think they're inappropriately priced because I look at guys like Jerome Ford, Kenneth Gainwell, and I mean, even the Ezekiel Elliott's, Leonard Fournette's of the world. And I just kind of like, honestly, I'm picking like second tight ends and quarterbacks a lot in that range of the draft. Like, it's not this way anymore, but it sort of used to be like, okay, I can, well, I can take Geno Smith to round out the stack, or I can take Jamal Williams. And I was just never. Also, I'm just like kind of concerned that Jamal Williams like really sun run with the touchdowns last year. Like Amon Ross St. Brown got tackled at the one yard line five times. And why wouldn't Taysom Hill just be the goal line back for them? Like, I kind of think he's just going to do the same thing he's always done. And so if you start, if you start chopping up the pie and saying, all right, well, Taysom's going to get some and Kamara is going to get some and Kendra Miller's going to play a little bit. Like you're looking at like a four way split at the goal line, which is like why you would be drafting Jamal Williams. So if Jamal Williams buries me, I mean, look, that's, that's the guy who buries me this year. Yeah. I don't imagine you had a whole lot of Jamal last year. So why should, why should it, you don't want to chase those touchdowns, do you, Davis? You don't want to, trust, yeah. you don't want to chase the touchdowns. Anyway, we're, we're about a month out from uh, the big money, money drafts. And uh, we're going to get back here. We're going to talk about a number of subjects that can really help your team win. But first we're going to hear from our sponsors. Hey, you know, people always ask me, what's the World Series of Fantasy? What's the Super Bowl of Fantasy? And it's easy. It's the FFPC. Their signature Players Championship has a $6 million prize pool. And their best ball leagues start in February. And they're the answer to so many questions. Hey, what's the best place to get a Dynasty Orphan? Well, you can adopt a Dynasty Orphan at the FFPC right now. There's more orphans at the FFPC than anywhere else on the internet. That's why we partner with them. So if you want to play fantasy football for low, medium, high stakes, you love Dynasty, you love best ball, you love seasonal leagues, all types of fantasy footballers need to go to the FFPC and remember... Use promo code UNDERWORLD. Promo code UNDERWORLD gets you $25 off your first team. Promo code UNDERWORLD, $25 off your first team, no matter what the format is, at the FFPC. Go get it. Have you drafted uh, any main events yet in the slows, Davis? Yes. Yeah. So I've got, I've got one slow main event. We are about to make our 17th round pick. Uh, so this is a group of guys. We've done this. We bought two teams in 2018 and we have been rolling them over in various configurations since then. So we haven't deposited again. We haven't paid out. We have uh, enough scratch. We finished 69th in the main event last year and won our individual league and got top points. So that rolled over into three teams for us this year. And that is uh, every every year we've done it, we have won at least one of the leagues we've done. So we've done two or three every year, and we've won our league uh, at least one time, which has kept us in the FFPC ecosystem. Yeah, no, it's it's awesome. And, and I've bumped heads with you in the NFFC as well. Uh, Davis is drafting a lot. He's got a lot of skin in the game. So it, this is uh, definitely a... Uh, a good guess. We kind of talk the same language on this. And one question I've been asking everybody on First Class Fantasy, the, the podcast that I split with Billy Muzio, and also here on press coverage is when you look at all these players and you're trying to identify your targets and, and maybe your rankings, who's the player that if you could know their final season stats, uh, that would be the one you'd really want to know? Maybe it's a guy that unlocks teammates. Maybe it's a guy that just gives you like a wide range of outcomes in, in your in your thought process on him. Who would it be? So this is a question I think you can take one of two ways. So the first one being, I know this guy's stat line and I can take him in every single draft if he's the guy you need to have. So that gives you information about, you know, who would be this year's Josh Jacobs. And then the other way is you take a look at the stat line of like a really important player for a really important fantasy offense. So that would be like, you could get Travis Kelsey's. You could get Stefan Diggs. 
uh, you know, and then if those guys have great seasons, you get some information there. If they have bad seasons, you get a lot of information. You know, if you know Travis Kelsey plays four games, you're getting a shit ton of, of contextual information there. I, I think, though, as we are doing this on Wednesday, August 2nd, it's, I think Jonathan Taylor is actually no. probably the answer because if you knew his 17-game stat line, I, I think, one, you'd get some contextual information. You'd be able to interpret a little bit about Anthony Richardson and, and you know, Michael, like if Jonathan Taylor has a 19-touchdown season, it probably means the offense was pretty efficient, more efficient than the market is projecting. But even more so, I mean, we are... 10 months removed from Jonathan Taylor being the consensus first overall pick in drafts. And he's going in the third round in a lot of these best ball drafts right now. So I think as of right now, it would be Jonathan Taylor. I think some of the other candidates would be Jackson Smith and Jigba. Cause you'd learn a lot about Seattle's offense there. I think, I think he's a pretty good candidate as well. I love the JSN answer. We haven't heard that one for many weeks. The answer was Kadarius Tony from a lot of people uh, then now with the injury, people are a little less uh, into that. Deshaun Watson has kind of been my answer since the Browns are steamed up so much. And is Watson that value uh, if you're avoiding kind of the early QBs? Uh, but it's, we've had some great answers on that. It's a really good thought process for kind of yourself. Um, and then we did have Rich Rebar who would go full Biff Tannen and tried to figure out a way he'd make a ton of money on this answer. So I, I respected that a lot as well. One guy who also suffered a, a an injury recently. It's recent news to react upon is Cooper Cup. Cup had steamed up here. Um, you know, if you started drafting in, in April and May, Cup was going towards the tail end of the first round. There'd been a lot of positive vibes. Uh, you know, the, the, the thought was him and Stafford are going to get back to their 2021 uh, level of play. And even last year, Cooper Cup led all wide receivers in fantasy points per game. Now you have a guy coming off of an injured season and now we have a soft tissue injury early in the year with the hamstring. The Rams are going to hold him out. Doesn't sound like he's going to miss week one, but how are you adjusting Cooper Cup in your approach to drafts? I'm, to be honest, I'm not. I'm not. I I think that some of the risk, honestly, is already baked in, literally to him being the fourth or fifth pick. I think the risk was like, Cooper Cup was the offensive player of the year two years ago. He was on pace to have a season just as good as his offensive player of the year season last year yeah he's 30 yeah he is coming off of a lower body injury but i it's a weird i actually would sort of prefer a what he had which was a, an ankle sprain like just a gnarly ankle sprain surgery to an acl or an mcl or something like that because he is going to be able to put weight on that pretty soon and i i would imagine he's basically just been working out i don't know probably the last four months three months something like that like he should be good and I'm also just sort of buying like a little resurgence on the Rams. Like, I don't think they're going to be as bad as they were last season. And honestly, I don't really think it matters that much. But yeah, I'm still taking him. Maybe I would tie break on taking Tyreek over him now just because it's close enough. But I think his median projection for 17 games is like a lot better than Stephon Diggs, than A.J. Brown, than those guys. So I'm still taking him there. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Tyreek kill over Cooper Cup guy, especially at this point. But I think you do have a good argument. It's the peak outcome season for, season for Cup is certainly higher than the other guys you mentioned, the, the amount of targets he could earn. Uh, but one guy that I've been very bullish on, I selected in my main event, and I know you're also on, is Cam Akers, his teammate. Maybe talk about uh, you know Cam Akers this year. I think he's he's a great value where he's going, and, and I think he's going to see a ton of volume. Is that how you're seeing this situation as well? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, so I, I do really like acres. I don't find myself drafting running backs and that pocket of the draft in best ball all that much. Actually, weirdly enough, it would be a spot where I think he's better priced in, in the main event in FFPC contests where you're not stressing as much. If your fifth wide receiver isn't great, you know, I, uh, and, and, you know, Peter Overzen, those guys always give me a hard time for being the running back guy. And to be honest, I mean, my history in the main event, I have started some hilarious guys at running back to on really. I mean, I remember one one week last year, we started Philip Lindsay at at running back to like a guy who was playing in the USFL this year. You know, like we we disregard running back to pretty heavy. But Ake, I mean, honestly, you could even draft Akers, I think, as an anchor RB because. I mean, he's really it. I don't imagine that they're planning on starting Zach Evans or Kyron Williams and you know, there's Akers has had this weird career where he's been benched. They said they were going to waive him. They said they were going to trade him. Then he like literally last season, they were like, we're going to waive you if we don't trade you. 
Then they just bench him for Ronnie Rivers one week. And then by the end of the season, he literally had a 100% snap share game. So I think he's going to play a ton. I don't think he's all that special, but he will be a big beneficiary if my base assumption, which is that the Rams are going to be a little bit better this year, comes through. I think he should have like a really nice role. Yeah, I actually took him as my anchor on this team. It was a four wide receiver start with uh, Akers and Herbert at the five, six turn out of the 12. And then I got Javante Williams super late uh, before we had like the kind of positive injury news. So that team's got a little bit of juice. Um, one one other uh, wide receiver who's actually got some polarization now and not really based on production, but really based on kind of some fear is Devonte Adams. Last year, he saw a career high in targets. He saw a career high in air yards his first year in Vegas. Now you have the quarterback change, but Devonte Adams price has already kind of been baked in. You're seeing him as a, you know, let's call him a early to mid second round pick. To me, he's that's kind of a, a correction, but you're seeing it as an as a overcorrection. Talk about your enthusiasm for Devontae Adams and the sort of value he brings you uh, in the second round. So Devontae Adams, I mean, I tweeted this out um, like two weeks ago. So each year for the last five years, he's been wide receiver six or better. He's been the wide receiver one twice. The last time he finished outside of the top 12 scoring of wide receivers, was in 2017 he is he's got at he he is in a travis kelsey-esque situation where he is going to be the first read on like every raiders passing play he had a 30 point game with jared stidham i'm not really worried about jimmy garoppolo and to be honest jimmy garoppolo if you actually go look at it he never threw that much in san francisco but he had he i mean he made debo samuel like he was the quarterback when debo samuel change fantasy football he brought brandon Ayuk out of a slumber you know brandon Ayuk was like playing behind river crack raft in practice the coaches hated him and brandon Ayuk, I, I think he posted like four top 15 weeks last season um you know george kittles had massive games with him and i think of the two things what's more likely to regress to the mean josh jacobs turning back into a back end rb1 high end rb2 or Devonte adams scoring fewer fantasy points per game than garrett wilson like I think it's more likely that Jacob sort of becomes a more normal fantasy football running back than the guy who's breaking the scoring every single week. I just, I just am not concerned at all. And honestly, even if Brian Hoyer was the quarterback, which is, does not seem on the table, Garoppolo passes physical. He's been at practice. It's all fine. I still don't really care. Like Devonte Adams is he, it, he's going to get, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't gone through all my projections yet. I, I'm sort of doing that slowly this year. But my guess is, like, if I pulled up ETR stuff or whatever, or your guys' stuff, he's got to be, like, 170, 180 median targets. It's it's insane. Yeah, it's it's. I think the hate's gone way, way too far. I actually think there'll be a slight correction, um, you know, as we get to the money weeks in, like, early September. I think he'll be right back at that one-two turn where he was last year. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, you can build some potential monsters. Right now, you can build Diggs or, you know, Amon Ross St. Brown or whoever you're – you know, your preferred, uh, you know, wide receiver is towards the end of the first round and follow up with Devontae Adams. So it's, it is, it is a very interesting, uh, you know, time. And I will say Nelson Sousa, who's one of the better NFFC drafters, he has zero concerns as well. He's been, he's been smashing on Devontae Adams. He's going to be joining Billy Muzio and I on Friday uh, on first class fantasy. Definitely tune in for that one. Uh, another player that you're seeing as an absolute smash pick in the second round, uh, he's a guy that, you know, you're going to probably get in the mid second in FFPC. He's going at the end of the second round in NFFC is Tony Pollard. I'm all in this year, Davis. I think that this is RB one overall potential outcome. I think the volume concerns are, you know, they're not really there for me. I think they'll figure out a way to get the ball in his hands. When, when you're talking Pollard, do you see a big uptick in his receiving usage? Or do you see this as something where, you know, he's going to get a, a a ton more carries than maybe the market's projecting. Okay. So even if Pollard just duplicated his season last year, where he's going right now, it would be a small loss where he's going like small, right? Uh, I believe last year. And yeah, I mean, in, in full point PPR last year, uh, he finishes the running back eight in non PPR. He finished as the running back eight as well. And Dallas had 529 running back carries last year, which I think was more than everyone but Atlanta. 
So even if they re-sign Zeke, even if they bring in Fournette, even if they bring in Kareem Hunt, all of which at this point we are 32 days away from the start of the NFL season, seems less and less likely, although maybe with Ronald Jones's suspension they do decide to do that, I really don't care because I think the base expectation for him should be 220 carries and something like 70 targets, maybe more. I think he's. I think the thing is he's got way more upside in the passing game than the market is anticipating. I mean, he saw 55 targets in limited time last year, and he saw 46 targets in 2021 where he really did not play all that much. Um, so in 2021, he played 374 snaps and was targeted 49 times. So if you just extrapolated that out a little bit, I mean, he could have... You know, Karain has that legendary upside series that he did on Roto World. And I mean, you're talking like this could be a guy averaging 17 and a half carries per game, but like five and a half, six targets per game. I He's my most, I believe he's my most drafted running back on underdog. I'd have to go check that for sure. But I don't really see, I mean, obviously he could get injured. Um, another, another point that I haven't heard very many people make is that this is the first time in Pollard's career he's gone into a season and this is including in college. He never was a starting running back in Memphis in college. This is the first time he's ever had six months to get his body ready and do his workouts with the anticipation that he would be a full-time back. So I would imagine he's probably in the best cardiovascular shape of his career. That was something the Cowboys running back coach who got fired, Skip Pete, uh, mentioned last year was they didn't think he was like big enough or, or, or strong enough to be a full-time running back. But my guess is he is probably 215 pounds right now instead of like 205 and that he's probably in extremely good cardiovascular shape. I, I think the sky is the absolute limit for him. Yeah, I love it. I mean, and Pollard gives you an opportunity. I had in, in an NFFC draft, like if you get the 101 in NFFC, you sometimes have exposure to, to Pollard at 24 overall I mean, that could be complete cheat code. FFPC, um, you know, you see him go a little bit higher. Uh, how high would you be willing to push him up in redraft right now, Davis? I mean, I have done this a couple times, not a ton, but in on I in in best ball teams, I've done Adams at like pick 10 and Pollard at pick what would it be, 14 coming back around or whatever. Like I, ju- I think that there's an argument to take him behind Austin Eckler and take him over Nick Chubb. I, I don't know if I would do that on the clock in a main event because, I you know, obviously, like, taking a 15-spot jump or a 10-spot jump in ADP is, like, a lot in a $1,500 league where you're only playing four or five teams. It's different in best ball. But I just feel – I just – I might do it because that's how much I want to have him on – if I like, if I don't get him on one main event team, I'm going to be pretty bummed out about it. I wanted to pick your brain on one other thing. Right now, we're seeing such wide receiver enthusiasm in the high stakes, whether it's FFPC, whether it's NFFC, and certainly wide receiver enthusiasm on underdog. Do you think that there is an argument to a running back, running back start, where you can start out with a Bijan and let's say a Tony Pollard, uh, and you potentially have two top five running backs? Or is it just too difficult to make up for it at wide receiver this year? I think you're, 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 especially because you would like to get a tight end who projects for a reasonable amount of receptions. I think it's pretty hard. Now, what I do like in FFPC is if you draw the 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, is to get Bijan. Like, I yes. love getting Bijan or Eckler at 7, 8, 9. Um, I think that's a huge win because then you can just be like, all right, I'm just riding the wide receiver avalanche, but starting – like, for example, Bijan Chubb, then your wide receiver ones like Metcalf or Debo or Ridley, and you're like, damn, like, I am losing wide receiver every week. Like, I'm losing. I, I project for 10 points worse at wide receiver than the Justin Jefferson uh, Cooper Cup team or whatever. Like, I, I feel like that is a lot to to make up for. Yeah, those those wide receivers kind of like at the, the tail end of the of the third round, when you get into like the Keenan Allen, Ridley, Cooper, Christian Watson, Jerry, Judy, like for that particular range, like let's say you you got stuck and you did go running back, running back, which of that little tier of wide receivers are you kind of most into? Let's take T Higgins and DK Metcalf out of the equation because they get kind of pushed up a little bit in some of these drafts. I think it's really the five I mentioned, Allen, Ridley, Amari Cooper, 
and then the two kind of actually guys are the exact same age in Christian Watson and Jerry Judy. Well, Debo is in that range as well. Debo, yes, be, yeah, yeah, right. Debo, so Debo would be my my main answer to that. I I love taking Debo just because it's like, you know, I don't care that much about his median projection. He's gonna have four weeks a year where he completely wins me the week. You know, like he's getting thirty, he's getting thirty three, and I just win because he was the highest scoring player the whole week. And I, I mean, I I do think it's like inarguable, like Purdy winning that job, even if Purdy kind of turns back into a pumpkin. They're going to run the style of offense that needs the ball in Debo's hands more often. Now I had, I'm one of these slappies that had been taking Ridley after the training camp clip. I was like, God damn, he just looks so good. I can't, I liked I can't your, not co- take your, him. Your, your comment Davis, where you said, I think he looks like one of the guys from 300. I thought that was, that was pretty funny. He looks, I mean, he, he, he looks, looks incredible. Absolutely. He does. Yeah. He looks unbelievable. Now he's got this toe injury, so maybe that'll linger a little bit. I mean, he is like 29 years old and hasn't played football in two years, so like it might take his body some time to get used to the rigors of it. But I would say, I, I would definitely say Debo and Ridley are the guys. Like honestly, I just don't really want to take Amari Cooper. I really, I really don't. I mean, We're part complete, of it is, yeah. I think Elijah Moore is really good, and I think he's going to siphon off more targets than Mark and anticipates. But also, and I say this all the time, people are probably sick of me saying it. The, the weather in the back half of the season for the Browns is going to be a problem. It's been a problem every year. They're right next to a lake. The way the stadium is built is it funnels the wind through. It knocks. They, they had three games last year where the total opened at like 39 or 40, and then the weather impacted the stuff over the rest of the week, and it got below 34. There was that Saints game where they were like, we don't even know if we're going to be able to throw passes in this game. It's so bad. And – Look, dude, you get that in week 14, your fantasy football championship, the total of that game is 31, and you're like, Amari Cooper projects for 11 points this week. Like, am I starting him or Jacoby Myers? Like, it's just going to be a miserable spot. Yeah, I'm completely out on Amari Cooper. The It's too much of a correction for me. Last year, we could get him in wide receiver three land. Now he's got pushed up. I saw him go 212 in a, in a, in a FPC. I mean, I've seen him get pushed up. It's like, He's never had more than 130 targets, and I and like you talked about the increased target competition. I think the kid Cedric Tillman will start getting drafted as we get close to the season as well. I think he's looked pretty good and getting positive reports. So tons of target competition, even if that offense takes a step forward. And Davis, you're definitely pouring some cold water on the on the Week 17 Jets Brown stacks that, that people are diving can't, into. Couldn't you couldn't you literally see that game being like it's 17 degrees. The wind is blowing. It's 15 miles an hour with 25 mile an hour gusts, like, and it's got the lowest total on the board that week. Like, I can just see it in my mind. Yeah, it would be it would be absolutely awful because that's like the automatic Deshaun Watson, Elijah Moore stack, and then you keep building it. You've a bunch of maybe you have Garrett Wilson with that. It, it could be ugly. Um, want to stick with it because we talked about Cooper. You mentioned Josh Jacobs. Last year was like the year for the unknown upside guys got kind of crushed. And a lot of these really like kind of boring, but hey, I guess I'll take them there. Structural guys all hit. You had Lockett, you had Amari Cooper, you had Miles Sanders, and you had Josh Jacobs. Each of those guys finished top 15 at their position, and they were all dirt cheap. Who are some veterans that you think are right now maybe a boring pick, not a lot of buzz, but could return a lot of value right now? Well, I mean, it's Lockett for the fourth year in a row, I think. I mean, that just feels that just feels like so obvious. He's in this great situation where Gino's way better than we think. I don't really think Smith and Jigba is going to challenge him all that much. Uh, I mean, I think Smith and Jigba is going to play, but I actually see uh, Metcalf being sort of the loser there in the context of Lockett's role is not going to change, but Metcalf could see his role change a little bit. Um, at running back, I mean, I think Akers is a candidate. I think David Montgomery is a candidate there. I could also see Cortland Sutton being a candidate for that. We're like, ah, oh, he's not really that good. He's a deep threat, yada, yada. But like, I mean, he's going after guys like, I would definitely take Cortland Sutton over Michael Thomas. I would probably take him over Kadarius Tony. Brandon Cooks is a great example of this, actually, where it's like he finally was bad last year. Like we haven't seen Brandon Cooks be bad ever when he's played. But you know, there's a lot of mitigating circumstances there. He got hurt. The offense was horrible. Like they, they were barely trying to win games. Like it was just all a mess for the Texans. And he's in, I mean, you'd much rather Kellen Moore be the offensive coordinator, but Brandon Cooks is is a good one. Yeah, I love the Brandon Cooks call. I think that's a really good one, and uh, he's still quite affordable. 
And I think they're going to be a little less uh, reliant on tight end targets, especially in the red zone, which should hopefully be a boon for, you know, Pollard, but also, you know, more wide receiver targets in the red zone. I think it's just natural. Just want to pick your brain. You're usually pretty uh, in line with Dallas Cowboys stuff. Where are you at with Jake Ferguson? Because right now he's going extremely late. And we've seen uh, DAC tight ends kind of never finish lower than like a, you know, mid tight end two in counting stats. Ferguson's closer to like tight end 28, 29, 30 level. Are you in or out on him, especially with uh, Luke Schoonmaker being unavailable? Yeah, I'm super in. Um, I don't think he is now. He was my most drafted tight end for a while. Let me let me check. Um, so Jake Ferguson is my third most drafted tight end. Uh, I mean, yeah, he just he's a starting tight end. I, I don't think he's like partic- I don't think he's spectacular. Uh, I don't think he's gonna draw a hundred targets. But you know, in a in a league context in the main event where tight ends are way pushed up, I mean. Like, I think you got to take like Pat Fryermuth really early and like Greg Dulcich goes in the sixth round. Like you are, you are just kind of in jail if you miss out on that, on like the first five tight ends. And I mean, I think you're just going to be comfortable starting Jake Ferguson most weeks. Now you're going to eat it, but guess what? Like the George Kittle guy is going to eat it some weeks too. George, George Kittle is going to have a bunch of two for 20 weeks over the course of the season. Now Ferguson's highs aren't going to be as high as Kyle Pitts or TJ Hawkinson or whoever, but he's going to give you a bunch of 12, 13 point weeks. Like, uh, you know, Schoonmacher, it's, it's August 2nd. He still hasn't practiced. He's still on, he's still on the pup list. Like this is a rookie tight end. This is, even if he was fully healthy tomorrow, I don't think he's going to be able to get up to speed to be able to start at tight end. Yeah. And he definitely wasn't a guy that we liked at all in the draft process, um, you know, compared yeah. to some of the other guys selected near him. And, and now he's missing time. Um, so Ferguson it is, it is, seems like the kind of guy that for home leagues, people are going to be rushing to the waiver wire after like week one, when it becomes apparent that he's a thing and wanted to pick your brain on this. This could be a fruitless endeavor because Zeke Elliott's still out there and he could sign and, you know, you know, be the backup in Dallas. But right now there's a little bit of uh talk between Malik Davis and Rico Dowdle is starting to get a little bit of positive vibes uh, out of camp. Let's say they don't sign Zeke. And let's say they go into the season with Tony Pollard, Deuce Vaughn, and then one of these two is the handcuff. Do you think that this is something like for 20-man uh, leagues like an FFPC where we're handcuffed ch- cuff chasing towards the end of our drafts? Should we be looking to draft a Malik Davis or do you think the Dowdle talk is correct? Uh, it's definitely not Rico Dowdle. I don't okay. think. I mean, Rico Dowdle had – I mean, he would have had a chance to play last year. Malik Davis actually came in – when Zeke was out a little bit last year and was like getting more carries than I think you remember. I mean, he got up to, he got up to 38 carries last year. He had eight against Chicago. He had 10 against Tennessee, had a couple targets in those games. I, I think with the, it, it might've been up in air before, but now with the Ronald Jones suspension, I just think he's pretty locked in. He's actually, I was just looking, he's my most drafted player on DraftKings because those are 20 round drafts and he's always there in the 20th round. And yeah, I don't really see that much of a difference between him and someone like Ty Chandler or Jerome Ford. Like it's a pure contingency value bet, but I mean, there could be some weeks where Dallas is up 14 points or whatever. And Pollard, you know, gets put on ice and Lake Davis is sort of in an Elijah Mitchell way, sort of salting the game away. Yeah, no, that was definitely a guy that I was drafting a lot of, um, you know, in early drafts. And, and now it's like, I don't know, it's a little bit of a, uh, I don't like reading about uh, Dowdle. It just seems funny to, to the, the kind of uh, Cowboy staff talking him up. Um, but let's stick with the running back position, Davis, because you know the term dead zone is something we've always talked about in the off seasons. But now it's sort of changing a bit because you're not having to use a second round pick or an early third to get exposure to some of these backs. Now you're starting to see like RB10, which would have been like a back end of the first uh, round pick, you know, five years ago. Those kind of guys are going in the third round. How are you viewing the dead zone this year? Do you think it's something that you know you're still wary of, or does it start a little later? And who are some of the running backs that are being drafted? You know, after RB one, like basically your favorites of the high end RB threes and running back twos. Yeah, so I think the dead zone is like Alexander Madison, J.K. Dobbins, Miles Sanders. I mean, Akers and Pierce a little bit. They're sort of the the guaranteed volume 
guys that are like not that special, not that efficient. Honestly, it, I think you could extend it all the way to like DeAndre Swift, James Conner, Rashad White. No, it's not to say that like, I think the difference is these guys are more appropriately priced. You know, I mean, Rashad White as the starter on a terrible team five years ago, three years ago, would have been a fourth round pick just because he was so locked in to that week one projected volume. And it's just a different risk proposition now. Like you've got four wide receivers on your team a lot of the times by the time you're taking Rashad White. So, you know, you can kind of you can kind of take on that risk. It, Madison's new price after Cook was officially released, him and Sanders are the two guys. I'm like, I just really cannot click on these guys at all because I just really do not see it with them. Yeah, I'm completely with you on on Madison. Sanders at least has the the like the volume argument, but Madison last year the same coaching staff didn't even give him 100 carries. So I don't buy into this whole like he's going up to 250 carries this year. I think it's just a it's a bad bet to make. And also, I don't think he's going to get the same sort of receiving work that Dalvin Cook got. So I'm kind of intrigued by taking like dart throws at, at McBride at this point. Um, but I do want to touch, pick your brain on Damian Pierce and Rashad White. Damian Pierce last year, we were drafting as, well, we weren't necessarily, but the market was in FFPC main events. He was like RB18 when we were drafting in the money weeks. He got steamed up big time. Comes out, has what would have been a thousand yard season, showed explosiveness. Now he's, you know, all, by all accounts, he looks better this year, really worked on his body in the offseason. And you can get him in the sixth round. Rashad White, you know, was a guy that we worried about a little bit um, during the NFL draft, them bringing in a ton of competition. But his competition right now is Sean Tucker and Chase Edmonds. Both of those guys have some appeal to me, Davis. Where are you at on Pierce? And where are you at on Rashad White? Pierce, I like a lot more than White because I can tell myself a story about the Texans offense being better. You move on from Davis Mills. You don't have the Brandon Cooks like saying he doesn't want to be here. Like it's just all, it's all young guys. It's a more forward thinking coaching staff. Like you don't have, uh, you know, ancient Lovey Smith coaching there. Like it just, there's, there's a chance the Texans can be the, 21st best offense instead of the the dead worst offense in football. I mean, there were weeks where Damian Pierce would play every snap at running back. You know, he'd be he'd be in there uh like uh, okay, for example, uh week 10, week 11 against the Commanders last year, he played 77% of the snaps. He ran all the routes on third down. He got 10 carries for 8 yards. I just don't foresee very many of those games happening to Pierce this season. So he's got like a pretty valuable workload. And I mean, I guess the same thing is true for Rashad White, but you just don't have like, no one cares about this Baker Mayfield versus Kyle Trask debate because it just seems like they're both going to be horrible, which seems like the median outcome to me. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I don't think the offense is going to be great, but I do think it's going to be consolidated. And I think White's going to get enough work in the passing game that I think he's going to uh, return some value there. And I think that, you know, he he flashed enough to me last year. I know there's all this whole narrative. He, he didn't run the ball very well. But I, I think he's, a you know, again, it's year two. And I think the chances are he could be a 60 catch guy. So I'm kind of in on him. You mentioned the Bucks are a team that you're, you're fading. Obviously, we hate the quarterback situation. But Chris Godwin has gotten pushed down pretty big time. And Mike Evans has gotten pushed down even further. Are you in on drafting these guys as a bet on – target consolidation and one of them kind of returning value here. I mean, Godwin, we're talking about a guy that's been pushing a hundred catches and Evans, you know, had some bad games down the stretch, but the counting stats were very good. Obviously huge quarterback downgrade, but are, is this a situation we should stay away from or is this a situation you want to take shots on? I, I want to take shots on Godwin and Kate Otten because Otten I think is, is, I really, he's just Jake Ferguson, but but on the Tempe Buccaneers. But Godwin, I mean, if you just think of the archetype of player he is versus Evans, it's going to be, I mean, this is Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham with Baker Mayfield all over again, where Odell runs the sort of routes that Mayfield struggles to throw, and Godwin, closer to the line of scrimmage, easier throws, intermediate, very quick, first read type stuff. I mean, I think Godwin can probably just be Chris Godwin again. I mean, and you know, the Buccaneers offense was not good last year. They just led the NFL in passing attempts. He had 142 targets and 104 receptions. I mean, maybe even scale that down to 120 targets and 80 receptions, and he's still probably a win 
at his ADP. And if he gets any positive touchdown variance at all, you're feeling even better. Whereas I think Evans is going to, it's going to be like all he, I mean, he would need to score like 10 touchdowns. I think for you to feel like you missed out on not drafting him. Yeah. I, I think Godwin is definitely the, the better bet, but I do think there's an argument to be said that nobody wants to draft any Buccaneers. Nobody wants to draft any Arizona Cardinals. Therefore, I think that those are the kind of teams that I want to try to look in and find some value. I know last year, nobody wanted to draft Browns. Nobody wanted to draft Seahawks. Obviously, we don't see a Geno coming out of nowhere for, for the Bucs, but uh, sometimes those beat up well, the, offenses. The Buccaneers, the Buccaneers would be the answer to who can be this year's Seahawks in terms of a team that's come in completely left for dead. They have good wide receiver talent. You know, Baker Mayfield is the cast-off veteran playing the Geno Smith role. I mean, this is a guy who was really good as a rookie, Heisman Trophy winner. Everyone says he's got an attitude problem. Like, this is all the stuff that followed Geno around. You know, I can squint and see it. It's just hard to it's hard to enact that. Let's stick at the wide receiver position. Uh, right now, there's been a lot of recent Sky Moore steam. You've seen him move up to, like, wide receiver four land solidly. Uh, he's a, I'd call him a, mid, a mid-level a mid wide receiver four that could be heading up, like, as we get to the money weeks, he could touch wide receiver three land. I think the enthusiasm for him is there. But there's another wide receiver that you've been smashing on Kansas City, and that's Rashi Rice. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you like about him, Davis? Well, what I like about Rice, I mean, one, I just like that we've seen a bunch of wide receivers get drafted by the Chiefs and then get pumped way up. McCall Hardman, Sky Moore. I mean, Rice is 60 picks cheaper than Moore was as a rookie, even and and even cheaper than Hardman was as a rookie. Now, Hardman had the mitigating circumstance for a long part of what we thought Tyreek Hill was maybe going to be suspended. So that made that a little bit different. But he's, I, and you know, like our dynasty prospect models and stuff don't really like Rasheed Rice, but like who cares? He plays with Mahomes and maybe he is good. Like, you know, whatever chance our models give him of being good, he might be. And I mean, the Chiefs wide receiver room, like you would think, I mean, Mahomes won MVP through for 5,000 yards and what do you have, 51 touchdowns? Like, and this is a crazy stat. Sam Sherman had this one. In full and half point PPR last year, there were three instances of Chiefs wide receivers scoring more than 20 points Juju twice and Hardman in a three touchdown game. And that was it. So, like, one, you could be like, yeah, well, of course that makes sense. These guys aren't very good. And Reed likes to do all this crazy stuff in the red zone. Or you could just say, that's just a lot of variance. I mean, that's just a weird thing to have happen. Now, the Chiefs do play their wide receivers sparingly. They rotate them a lot. Like after Juju got hurt last year, I believe no wide receiver played over 75% of the snaps in a single game until the postseason. Uh, you know, they had got, I mean, you know, freaking there's a special Marcus Kemp is out there running routes. Jody Fortson's running routes and that could happen again this year, but like it also might not like you might run into Rasheed Rice running 73% of the routes. You might run into Richie James being the primary slot wide receiver. Like, I like all these guys, honestly. I think it, where, what they cost, especially in redraft versus best ball, where if Rice doesn't work out and he's not playing, you just cut him. If Justin Ross doesn't make the team, you just cut him. If Richie James is only returning punts, you just cut him. Like it, it's fine. You, you and, and they don't have to be a roster clogger in that way because I think you're, we're going to get that information pretty soon. I've seen a number of redraft uh, players in in high stakes now doing the Kadarius Tony as a falling uh, as a falling ADP and then taking Richie James in like the seventeenth eighteenth round. I think there is something to that. Talk about Richie James, um, and I won't say why you really like him, but why you're kind of intrigued by him. Well, why I'm intrigued by him is already been confirmed by the team, which is that he's under no threat of not making the roster because he's the team's punt returner. So there's like a hundred percent chance that he's active on game days. And with the Tony injury, I'm looking at their team and I'm like, okay, Valdis Scaling and Justin Watson run the wind sprints on the outside. Sky Moore is sort of like the slot rotating around guy, but they need another guy. And that guy could be Ross. I guess theoretically they could play MBS and Watson a bunch together, but then you're talking about two guys who are just, you know, out there doing cardio. So like, I think Richie James week one might just run like 50% of the routes. And then like, I don't know, Richie James is like, when he's played, he's been like not terrible. Um, you know, he's obviously the, hit, 
he had the that crazy the legendary yeah. Thursday night game where was like the 30 thir- points the Thursday night game yeah which is even crazier because that was Debo Samuel's first game back from injury he was $200 he was minimum salary in showdown and Richie James like went absolutely nuclear but even last year right he's playing on this Giants team that like really doesn't want to throw the ball starting in week 11 he ran over 70 percent of the team's routes five for 41 and a touchdown seven for 61 and a touchdown seven for 66 and a touchdown eight for 90 against Minnesota like he was out there just like crushing it you know I mean he was playing a lot and like getting open I'm not saying Richie James is like Antonio Brown or whatever but you put this dude with Mahomes playing out of the slot I mean I don't know he could have he could I think a good comp for him is like when Russell Gage got thrust into full-time roles a couple times where it was like all of a sudden Russell Gage just ripped off a bunch of 17 point games, like just because he was in this perfect role for what he was able to do, even if you don't think he's that good. Yeah. It's definitely interesting because you have the QB one with a bunch of de- depressed price wide receivers, especially now with the Tony injury. So I, I think the correct, the correct answer is to take shots you want to walk away from your drafts with a Moore or Rice, uh, even if you don't have Mahomes. It doesn't have to be a stack bet, but one of these guys can end up becoming a weekly contributor. Um, I, I just think it's a very it's a very interesting um, process. And Davis, we've also seen Travis Kelsey have tremendous injury, not luck. He's very smart in the way he plays. It doesn't really take big hits, but he's been very fortunate to not miss really any significant time whatsoever during this incredible run like if he were to go out the the Chiefs are still going to score a ton of points um who would kind of be the the contingent upside guy that could go absolutely nuts touch wise maybe more I mean could be more honestly I think Noah Gray would just run a shit ton of routes like he would he would be on the field like 90 I mean he already played over 50 percent of the Chiefs snaps last year he just barely got targeted I don't, and I don't know it's, really, the answer is probably Kadarius Tony. Like Tony would be the guy who the coaches would have to be like, he might break. You know, we might only be able to do this for two games, but he's the only one of these guys who can get open. Like Travis Kelsey can get open, and it, like the the answer, like Tony will probably never make it as an NFL wide receiver. I mean, we're heading into uh, year three. He ran five freaking routes in the Super Bowl. Like you're not saving him for anything at the point at which you're at the Super Bowl. But to me, the answer of which one of the Chiefs wide receivers could actually be good enough to really capitalize on a 28% target share being removed from the offense, it's it's definitely Tony. Yeah, it's uh, it was definitely an interesting mental exercise. We took Noah Gray in the 20th round of the uh, Pros versus Joes FFPC draft when we got stuck on tight end three. Uh, so I, I think he's interesting. It's year three for Noah Gray. He was on the field a ton. He caught a pass like every game. Just didn't catch a whole lot of them, but he's on the field. So definitely uh, an interesting one. Um, Want to kind of pick your brain on offenses in general. You basically have a great ADP exercise is just picking the offenses that are kind of mispriced. Last year, you saw Jacksonville. You mentioned Seattle. Uh, you had C- You had, obviously, the Philadelphia Eagles. You had a bunch of these teams where like five players beat ADP, four players beat ADP, and they really beat it significantly just by picking those kind of upside offenses. Who are some offenses that you're looking at that are going to take a big step forward this year in 2023? I mean, I actually think the easiest answer, and this is not a popular answer, is the New England Patriots. So 2021, Mac Jones' rookie year, they were fifth in the NFL in weighted offensive DVOA, uh, ninth, I think, in unweighted offensive DVOA. Last year, they were basically the worst offense in the NFL. Like the Texans were pretty terrible, but they were, I, I want to say they were 26th in offensive DVOA. They didn't really have an offensive coordinator. They were changing who was calling plays. Like Joe Judge and Matt Patricia were the guys who were in charge of the offense. And this year, it'll be Bill O'Brien. Not saying Bill O'Brien is like some genius offensive mind who is going to, you know, have Mac Jones like being an MVP candidate. Because I don't think that's true. But going, I mean, Ramondre is a third round pick. Then no one goes inside the top 120 picks. Like Juju Smith Schuster is an 11th round pick. Like Parker, Thornton, Gasicki, Hunter Henry, the backup running backs, Mac Jones. These guys are honestly probably in a lot of main events just going undrafted straight up. And 
if they're the 12th best offense in football, if Mac Jones throws for 3,800 yards and 31 touchdowns, like that, it's, it's massive. I, I don't have a high degree of confidence in it, but it's one that logically makes, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think another one is Denver, basically just under the assumption that if you take Sean Payton's words from the, the famous interview now at face value, like Nathaniel Hackett was just the worst coach in the NFL. I think that's one thing that we sort of have learned, which is that you go from awful F minus coaching to like baseline C plus level coaching that can make a huge difference in, you know, ability to just generate consistent drives. Like the Jaguars last year, are a great example of that going from awful, awful urban Meyer to like pretty good Doug Peterson. I think we could definitely see that. Yeah. I love that answer. And it's the Brian Dable effect, the Mike McDaniel effect where you're able to maximize the players you have. I think that there's, Every single NFL roster has offensive talent. It's just being able to utilize and get the ball in the hands of the right players, put some pressure on the defenses. And the coaching and scheme absolutely does matter. It's proved time in, time again. We don't want to let that kind of let it make us push players up, but certainly want we want to consider uh, players when they get pushed down. Uh, want to get your opinion on the tight end position. This has been one. We've talked about Kelsey, uh, but people kind of have different approaches this year. You mentioned Denver. I know Greg Dulcich, Tyler Higby. That's been kind of an answer for some people that wait. Who's been your preferred targets at the tight end spot this year? I love Kyle Pitts. I can't help it. I mean, I just think he's so discounted based off of like a very bizarre season. And he really wasn't even that bad when he played. I mean, he earned targets at a good clip. A bunch of them were uncatchable. Sure, maybe Ritter will be as bad as Mariota. He could be. Uh, Probably not, though. And they threw more when Ritter came in. They threw 20% more pass attempts per game when Ritter came in. They don't really have a second wide receiver to speak of. So even if they play a bunch of two tight end stuff with Janu and Pitts, I think you'll see like Pitts will have like 70%, 80% route participation would sort of be my baseline projection. So I love, I, 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 and you know, whatever, maybe it's terrible. Maybe I'll eat it again. Um, but Pitts is my most drafted tight end right now. Uh, I love Dulcich. I really like Darren Waller. Honestly, though, I play tight end pretty flat. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at my exposures, and I've got like 15 guys between 6 and 9%, which means that I don't really love a ton of guys. And the guy I really like, Taysom Hill, is kind of useless in main event. He's good for best ball, but he's like kind of useless for main event scoring. You're going to want double-digit targets. Uh, you know, 10 north of 10 would be nice for your main event starting tight end. But I do agree. Tyson Hill in, in best ball is definitely one you want to want to hammer. And I like that you're on Waller. I actually think Waller is going to steam up. Um, I think he's going to pass George Kittle and Pitts when we get to the, the big money drafts because it's looking more and more like he's the focal point in New York. He already passed Goddard. So I, I agree with you on that. And the Dulcich one, um, maybe elaborate on Dulcich because I could see him rising up a little bit. Uh, I think people are kind of slow to this one. I expected a little bit more enthusiasm, especially after we had the Tim Patrick, uh, you know, injury. There's chance for a number of targets for Dulcich in that offense. I mean, the the combination uh, Tim Patrick injury, KJ Hamler waving, just like really opens up snaps for Dulcich because Hamler would have rotated in some. Patrick would have played a lot, I think, and now. If you're looking at getting your best five guys on the field, I don't really see how Dulcich comes off all that often. You know, I mean, look, I loved Albert O. Doesn't seem like NFL coaches feel the same way. Really feels like Dulcich is in line for, he's going to be that joker role in, in the Sean Payton offense. You know, he is, I think. And remember, like, remember, people have sort of forgotten how annoying Sean Payton offenses were with like third string tight ends and fullback scoring touchdowns. Like there's going to be, some real randomness for the Broncos this year, even if Russell Wilson is able to rebound from what happened last year, like Dulcich could still play a ton and have six touchdowns, but he also, I think can have like a fair, like, you know, some eight catch games and things like that. Yeah. The Joker role. It's funny. Cause you know, Peyton even went to kind of quantify it and he's like, it'll be the same role as, as Alvin Kamara and Darren Sproles and a couple of tight ends. So I'm like, you know, I'm all in for for Dulcich when when he falls. He's I think you know he's still at a relative value, so I'm in on him. Let's pivot over to quarterback Davis. We're nearing the hour mark. Lamar Jackson has moved within five spots of Josh Allen in FFPC main events, um, and 
there's a really a big four now. People talked about a big three for for many months. But who's the best value of the big four? Or are you passing on the big four? Um, in managed, I think I probably would actually prefer to pass. It just feels so hard in managed to, you know, third round pick. I'm skipping all these guys. Like, oh, am I really going to take Jalen Hurts here? Uh, I mean, I, I actually think Mahomes is the best value of them, honestly. Like, combination of one, weekly ceiling, two, the floor is literally as safe as it gets. Like, just so he's not going to get hurt, you know, because he doesn't run. He's that he's get, guy gets tackled like four times a year. He, you can back stack him really easy. That's the thing that kind of sucks with Hurts is you can't back stack him unless you take Goddard, who I don't like at cost. I prefer Waller. That is a big part of it. And and I would I would probably rank them in terms of value. Mahomes, Lamar, Allen, Hurts, just because of what happens to a team construction. Now, if you if you just draw a miracle and you're able to get Andrews and Lamar together, that would be my top combination. Getting that because Andrews goes in the second round. So you can get first round wide receiver running back, Mark Andrews, then Lamar Jackson. Like if you get that in the main event, that is a sick start to a main event like that is so good yeah we actually had uh mike shope and adam krautwurst on i filled in on the dominator last week and we talked about the idea of taking mark andrews at the 110 in a main event because then you can potentially do that where you know you could take uh lamar jackson at the 310 and be done at quarterback and tight end and and have that incredible correlation play um it's hard to push the button on mark andrews at, at that spot but I think you'll see it a little bit more and more because there's not a guarantee if you take Mandrews at the at the 12 spot or or the 201, there's not going to be a guarantee that you get Lamar Jackson at the uh, three four turn anymore. So uh, definitely an interesting interesting question. Justin Fields and 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 uh, and Justin Herbert are kind of in that next tier. You get those guys around the five six turn in FFPC draft, so a little bit cheaper. Again, I took Herbert in my main right there um but it's common and it's and it's there do you see those two guys as great value um or is that a, a tier you're trying to uh, avoid as well that is that is a tier i'm trying to avoid uh something you you really hate to do in the main event is chase differences in the scoring i i think i think that it, it would be uh good advice in general which is like you know just because guys are, are different in that scoring format doesn't mean you got to chase them up boards. Let's push it down. You get the Trevor Lawrence was going close to Justin Herbert earlier in the summer. You referenced Calvin Ridley. You referenced Doug Peterson. Year two of the Doug Peterson offense. You like the weapons there. Is Trevor Lawrence uh, a, a value? And then Deshaun Watson after him. Either of those guys intrigue you? So funny enough, I don't really like Trevor Lawrence's price on the face of it, but in this first slow main event that I did, Lawrence fell around past ADP, and we were we felt good at wide receiver. We uh, we I don't remember what we did at running back. We took we did an anchor running back strategy, and so we were like, yeah, like this is time. This is our last real ceiling guy because I think there's a pretty big break between Lawrence and Watson. Now that that could very easily be, you know, old takes exposed if Watson runs a ton and you know he just looks like 2020. Deshaun Watson again, but I think there's a real tier break there. I actually, I actually think if you miss the elite tier, the, the guy to get is Anthony Richardson, where it's like that dude, if he runs, you know, I mean, it's really just very simple. If he runs 110 times, he's going to way pay off his cost. Yeah, I like that one. Are you in also on the Geno, Daniel Jones, Dak Prescott, the that that tier, like those that's guys the are range. cheap. We yeah, got that's one the, the, that's we got the 13, range to 14 attack. Round. Yeah, and that's get, the range to attack in the main event. And you talk about like sometimes you don't know when quarterbacks fall. Like I think one of those guys falls to the 13th round like fairly frequently. So I think that's that's definitely interesting. Um, you've, you've given us an hour of your time, Davis. This was really, really a lot of fun. The last question I want to ask you is last year we saw running back threes all smash. You had Tony Pollard, Josh Jacobs, Miles Sanders, and then your guy, Ramondre Stevenson. And this was a great call you had. You said Ramondre Stevenson would be a top 10 running back. You predicted the usage. You said this is going to be an out there season where you're actually going to see a running back get a ton of usage uh, in the passing game under Bill Belichick and also get the rushing work. That came uh, you know, into, into fruition. 
So old takes exposed. Definitely uh, tag Davis on that one. And Davis, now you got to give the people this year's Ramondre Stevenson. Give us an RB3 who's going to smash. You can take it all the way down to the RB4s if you want. You can give us two names if you don't want to go go all in on a guy. All right, AJ Dillon as the first one. Uh, just, you know, the, the quad father comes through. He was such a disappointment last year. But the role was really about what we expected. The offense just kind of went sideways. I think he is an obvious one. And so that's going to be the first one. And then honestly, my other answer is Zach Charbonnet. Now, obviously the shoulder injury throws a huge wrench in that, but I did sort of feel cost adjusted. Like Walker and Charbonnet were both great picks. I still sort of feel that way. Cause like, let's say it's August 23rd and Charbonnet's like good and cleared to go. I mean, he would have just been just spent three weeks getting drafted at a huge discount to his projection. I think. I love the answers. Um, I really like the AJ Dillon call. It's also like a Aaron Jones was maybe propped up a bit by playing with Aaron Rodgers. Now you get a quarterback where they're a little less confident in, and why not hand off to AJ to you know to to AJ Dillon? And you bring up like last year, like he had the exact same stats as the year before. He didn't take a step forward, but it wasn't like a huge step back, and he did close the season very well. So I'm I'm glad you're on the AJ Dillon train. I do have a fair amount of him. Davis, let everybody know where they can find your work. They can check me out. You guys can follow me on Twitter at Davis Maddock. If you search my name on any podcast platform, you're going to find the Take Cast and the Sports Grid Fantasy Football Podcast. And you can watch Fantasy Sports Today every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. on sportsgrid.com or on Sports Grid TV. Yeah, and make sure and check out the GOAT District this evening. Scott Connor is going to be on. Uh, make sure and check out Man vs. Machine. It's dropping tomorrow on Thursday uh, with Mark Garcia, a.k.a. Hilo, uh, joining Dario Ofstein and myself. And then Friday, uh, Billy Muzio and I are going to be meeting with Nelson Sousa on First Class Fantasy, one of the best high-stakes uh, managers in the country. We're going to talk about some values, some fades, and some targets. Everybody enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and thanks for tuning in. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.